Okay, let's get started. Um, my name is Liz Bell. I'm a master's student here at Mines Environmental Engineering. And I'm happy to say that so far I understand most of the talk, so you guys are doing a great job. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I work with Dr. Zaki Kapp as my advisor and John as my co-advisor. I'm looking at um, novel four osmosis membranes and two nasty wastewaters, two different projects. One is municipal wastewater and the other is oil and gas produced water. So it's my pleasure to introduce today Dr. Scott Dawson. He is an associate professor at UC Davis where his lab focuses on the evolution and function of the cytoskeleton in anaerobic protists. So he began with his bachelor's at the University of Michigan. He followed it up with work on HIV epidemiology at Georgetown University and sequence annotation at Genbank. He then pursued his doctorate in Nord's lab at Indiana and UC Berkeley, where he identified novel groups of protists in the anoxic environment. He then stayed at Berkeley with Dr. Candy, Candy Lab, and uh, his postdoc where he initiated the study of gyrial cytoskeletal biology. So, join me welcome Scott. Let's get to John and Cheryl and perform. Uh, for the invitation, um, I mentioned that I worked at GenBank and I was an annotator and I was getting all these sequences. I kind of had, I was kind of the cleaner of problems when I worked there for about a year and a half. And I kept getting these ribosome RNA sequences. Um, from this pace. <laughs> I was like, why are we sequencing more rhymes? Could we know that sequence already? And I, I had no idea about the biology, but I was standing there. I don't know the clone name. Why? I don't get this at all. And then I, and I remember Sue Martin's name, and then I was thinking of applying to grad school, and I was like, I'm, not, I'm not really interested in molecular evolution and evolution of uh, cells, even. And, uh, and everyone said, you got you to talk to him. And so that was almost exactly 20 years ago. And, and when I was at, at a grad student uh, interview in Norm's, uh, I was in Norm's office in Jordan Hall in Indiana, and he was talking about the natural microbial world, something I had not really thought about. Um, and he took me outside the window of his office under the ledge to, to point out uh, another building and the, the black kind of building and the fact that they're dentalists. And I was just sold. <laughs> and so. I guess it's a testament to my career that I went on a ledge with Norm, <laughs> and it, it, it changed my life. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about how Jardia changes your life, <laughs> probably for the worse. <laughs> um, as you probably know, Jardia is an, it's an enteric pathogen, it's a eukaryote, it's commonly associated with contaminated water all over the place. We don't get it as much in the, in the developed world due to a water, adequate water treatment, it's actually comfortable. But it's really prevalent worldwide. And as you probably know, um, on this tree here, um, my job as a grad student in Armstrong was to fill out this part. And I, my, my uh, uh, kind of benchmark was Jaria, was this deepest branch in the eukaryotic tree. And I was trying to find these deeper, or even filling these gaps here. And after thinking about a lot of the exotic places to study, I actually ended up studying a place in Berkeley, kind of by 580 in the university, um, which is called Berkeley Aquatic Park. Um, it's also a really great day cruising park, or at least it was at the time. <laughs> so that made it a lot more psychologically interesting um, as a sampling site. Uh, and I'll just tell you, there are a lot of novel eukaryotes that <laughs> Not surprisingly. Um, but in this tree, uh, a lot of this tree uh, at the time, and even now, a lot of what we know about diverse kinds of eukaryotes is really from the study of pathogenesis or, or parasitism. And that's really the biology of non-model eukaryotes. Things that are up here are really these, these radar parasites. And Jardia is so divergent that it doesn't make, it makes plenty of sense that the biology is very different. And that's kind of my intro to the postdoc here. So there's a nice uh, image of Jardia here. My lab pretty much studies a lot of the cytoskeleton, in particular this region here that's called the ventral disc, which you can think of like a suction cup, and it's what Jardia uses to prevent very stuff through your guts and kind of grabs grabs onto your gut. It's a lot like this. <laughs> and, uh, this is probably an idealized picture. <laughs> um, but so, uh, so Jardy is a widespread, uh, sorry, okay, widespread intestinal parasite of a lot of kinds of, of animals. So the same uh, uh, Jardy strains that infect humans infect other animals, and of course they're the reservoirs for uh, us. Uh, 
Um, there could be both acute and chronic journey infections. People mainly think of acute infections as you present to the doctor with essentially explosive diarrhea <laughs> and, and often extreme weight loss. You know, if you wrap the weight loss within 20 pounds, another awesome symptom is uh, fatty or, or uh, highly lipid enriched stools, something called stenorrhea. So that's after breakfast. <laughs> there are about two and a half million cases per year in the US, but we're quite over, um, it's estimated about one billion people are affected by Jerry due to contaminated water. So it's a highly prevalent um, pathogen worldwide. And I will say there's about this many labs in the US that study the biology of Jerry Day. And I'm a big one, <laughs> a recent one. So there's a lot of work to do, and a lot of what I'm showing you is really new thinking about in vivo Jerry really only need to ingest a few cysts. On, on average, it's probably several um, million, but uh, prisoner studies in the 50s showed that you can ingest 100 cysts and, and get a, and to get a disease. But really the interesting thing, and kind of the basis behind the work I'm going to talk to you today, is it's really unknown how the swimming form of jury, this trochozoa, as it colonizes your intestine, causes the extreme symptoms that we see. We have no uh, production of a toxin, no idea that there's really minimal effect on our immune system. There's really only a little bit of an inflammatory response. There's been some ideas that it causes tissue damage, but it's not invasive. Um, so it's kind of sitting on the outside of the epithelium. It's really unclear of where that comes from. Some of it, I think, has to do with Jardia's biology. So Jardia is a lax mitochondria. It, it gets its energy from fermentation. And you can think of it as a microaerophile. It's not a strict, strict anaerobe. But it has some interesting biology so this is what happens when you eat Jardia. <laughs> so when you inject, you will ingest the cyst form, and these excyst in your after passing through your stomach into the small intestine. Um, and these are ingested from contaminated water or food, and the excyst that you get in the small intestine. Um, they rapidly divide and colonize the small intestine, so they go through uh, mitosis and colonization repeatedly. And then under some trigger, they'll be triggered to form the cyst stage again, so it's always been thought to occur in the, in the more distal parts of the bowel, uh, the, the large, in the colon especially, and then those are excreted into the environment in the cyst form, and that's kind of the dormant spore-like stage, but it's, it's infectious. So it's kind of what we have known if it's kind of the classic CDC diagram of Jardia biology. But again, we don't really know why Jardia makes you sick, and we know very little about why, what Jardia is actually doing in vivo. Because everything is, that we know about Jardia, for the most part, has been really through studying it in culture. So this is a journey can be grown exceedingly in culture and it will actually attach to slides using the ventral disc. So it will colonize the slides and you can freeze them and they'll come off or chill them won't come off. Um, but in the host, again, they're somewhat colonizing this environment that's not like a cover glass on a slide. It's with plenty of microbes. And as I talk to people about Jardia biology, no one had really asked the question about what about the environment that Jardia is inhabiting? than just the physical parameters of being in different parts of the gut. So you can imagine, um, Jardy is interacting with the host through its colonization and incestation, and it's all its life cycle processes, and it's also interacting with the microbiota, and we also do these having intimate uh, interactions. And as any uh, one could probably imagine, Jardy may be changing its local chemical environment and maybe competing for nutrients, either with the host or with the microbes. We we'll haven't really talked about this at all. So this is kind of one of the later things we did in this project, but I think some, something that's really the most forward, uh, something that's going to really help us in the future to think about in vivo biology of Jardia is that we integrated a firefly luciferase gene into Jardia strain under uh, just a, under a promoter for a, a constitutive gene. And then we can infect mice with this strain and using essentially a light box that can measure chemiluminescence, you can measure uh, uh, the parasite load essentially in live animals or sleeping animals. And that, that, that alleviates the problem of um, sacrificing animals in cohorts, taking out their guts, counting Jardia, which is the state of the art today. So now we can actually image live animals and show you this in a second to assess the in vivo physiology of Jardia. And then using zip race technology and tagging technology, we can tag anything we want, we can get any we want. We have access to a lot of different kinds of physiology. So this is something that we're just starting to do. Um, we can also do this in vitro assays of function. Um, we just got funded to look for, uh, essentially develop assays for drug development for Jardia using these different kinds of uh, in vivo recorders. Uh, this would be, again, 
metabolism gene, a cell division gene, and a gene involved in the cessation process. So now we can track all these processes live in vivo. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is the time course of one animal, and if it's red and hot, that's a raging infection. It's really good to think that way. And these are just the days. So you can see over the course of two weeks, the jury infection starts low. Um, we actually just gavage the trophozoites, feed them in, and then they colonize the gut. You get a kind of a maximal infection, usually between four and seven days. And sometimes, especially in this animal, it recurs. And we hadn't really tracked this before ever in a single animal. And this is actually really quantifiable and reproducible over time, and we can average over cohorts of animals and get nice plots that correspond pretty uh, directly to other measures of quantitative PCR or imaging or images of density of the person. Okay, and this gets a little gross, but you can imagine it's kind of cool. We can sacrifice the animal and take the intestinal tract out and lay it out in a petri dish. And so, in this just anatomical diagram, this would be the stomach. This is the proximal and distal small intestine, the large intestine and the cecum. And again, this is infected with bioluminescent geria. Uh, and you can see that they're mostly colonizing the upper part, the proximal part of the small intestine. And this is, again, quantitative, and we can score this in various ways. And it's interesting, as we did this, we found not only was it often proximal, it was often proximal distal in some animals. So you know, this image, live image, corresponds to this uh, ex vivo image. And then there are also some other variations, spatial variations, and patterns. So imagine in, in drug development or anything to study a cohort of animals, we might be getting any one of these patterns and not knowing it. Now we can actually precisely sample the sections that we want in an, in an animal at the time and ask, in this situation, in this region of the gut, in this time, what is germ doing? And because it's in this continuum of the host and microbiota, biota, we can ask what's going on folks and what's going on with the microbes in those situations. One thing you already know, uh, the idea, uh, one of the, the ways that your body reacts to inflammation is to produce reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. It's kind of just the nuclear detonation effect. <laughs> and so we know upon infection with Jardia, there's kind of a high amount of reactive oxygen species present. And you would imagine for an anaerobic organism, this is a good way to try to get rid of it uh, and affect its biology. And you can actually see this with the uh, imaging a compound called L012, which reacts with reactive oxygen species. So this is in live animals, uh, day five of the third infection, and we can actually measure and quantify the amount of inflammation. So we're just trying to link this now with the other kinds of images I showed. It just involves some spectral um, coupling. So as I mentioned, when you think about microbiology, you're really trying to study the in vivo uh, gut and sections, we can again it's really, I think, all about sampling. So we, we are comparing the right groups together with whatever method that we're trying to compare. So again, if we start with an animal and we sacrifice it and take a region of its gut, we can precisely sample different regions and array these and actually compare them between animals based on the geria load or spatial location or timing, etc., and different, different, different kinds of experiments. So in this case, we started to look at the metabolome and look down of these samples definitely found that there's an enrichment in jury infected animals for acyclicerols and glycerol phospholipids. And there's a lot of really interesting lipid and metabolism dysregulation in, in people infected with jury. And some of that also shows up in the bloodstream. We're able to just get a window on kind of what's going on in these samples that we're taking. Was that blood or was that stool? Oh, this is from the gut. It's an actual sample. Yeah, so we're not taking the endpoint of the personal track reaction. Sections of uh, one centimeter sections of the uh, essential as we go based on that and that bioluminescent uh, sampling. So, then this is a project that we just started doing about a year ago is to look at transcriptional profiling of both Jerry and the host. And this is a little complicated, <laughs> mostly because um, I mean, it's easy in a way because you can use oligo BT to get to enrich with eukaryotic mRNAs, but that includes both the host, the mouse, and Jerry. And the host cells outnumber Jaria RNA by about 100 to 1, even though it looks like it's a raging infection. So there are ways to deal with this. Luckily, with high frequent sequencing, we can get a lot more sequences now. And even though we still get 1%, we get decent numbers for statistics to compare essentially what in vivo Jaria does, or Jaria in culture, versus how Jaria acts in, in vivo. And 
That's why it's pretty different. <laughs> and the ways that it's different, so this is just kind of a plot of transcriptional profiling of in vivo kind of high infections of regions compared to in vitro, and then just looking at a profile that's up and down regulated. And a lot of the things, uh, sorry, this is first the mice. A lot of the things that are up and down regulated mouse have to do with host defense responses and oxidative stress, but as well as apoptosis, so an idea that germ causes host cell damage or initiates some sort of damage in the host. There's a little bit of evidence for that, but also what we find a lot of the genes that are upregulated or dysregulated are host genes to do with liquid metabolism, fatty acid metabolism, or specifically these are post metabolism. So kind of is consistent with the metabolome data that we see and the symptom, the clinical presentation of fatty stools. This is just a way of thinking about jarty infected animals and looking at the transcriptional profiles of, of the vitro ground jarty compared to in vivo. And this is just kind of a, uh, an analysis to, sh to show overall that in that cohort, the in vitro ground profiles look more like each other than the in vivo. And what we found is that there are about a thousand differentially expressed genes in these two situations. And typical for jarty, about 85% lack any clear function, meaning they're either pure hypotheticals that have no homolog in another organism, or they have just really a, a protein domain that makes it hard to call the function. So these are potential targets of things that are going on in vivo, but it's hard to call or annotate just based on what the genes do. Um, subgenes that we know are upregulated, which is interesting, are genes involved in incestation. That makes sense. As I mentioned, that's what happens in the process. But these genes for incestation are actually turned on in a place in the gut um, that people hadn't thought was where Jardia insisted. And so this is actually an incestation uh, biomarker. So we're just seeing uh, cells that are upregulating the incestation program. And it occurs, again, in the proximal small intestine. What the literature would say is it happens in the colon and much more distal parts. It's not even close. Um, and so when we look at these again, we can sort of size and look at, again, these, these profiles. And can stain from an antibody that specifically marks part of the cyst process, and we can actually image in these different regions that there are a lot of, there is indeed a lot of incestation going on in the production of these vesicles that produce the cyst wall. So that's actually bona fide compared to the, sorry, it's actually uh, compared to the uh, transcriptional profile. So it's consistent with that as well. In fact, even though it occurs from the distal, it's actually initiated in the proximal. I won't mention this, but we have some good evidence in the lab now that the reason jury is actually triggered to this has nothing to do with, well, maybe a little bit to do with the environmental conditions, and just as much to do with the population that's so in. So it's signaling itself, just like any other micro. When it's in a high abundance and dense, it can a lot of dodge on this force, regardless of the spatial place. So and using that, I think we can actually synchronize jury now about density. So this is, again, the, a somewhat similar plot of transcriptional profiling, uh, but now looking at Jardia. And I'll just summarize the kinds of things that are upregulated beyond the incestation program have a lot to do with Jardia's metabolism. These are really the most significant things have to do with carbon, uh, carb carbohydrate metabolism, and allium glutamine metabolism. It has to do with being an anaerobic eukaryote, um, and it's kind of the kind of fermentation it does. Glutathione has probably a lot more to do with the oxidative stress that it's getting assaulted with. This is a way that uh, some eukaryotes can probably deal with, that lack mitochondria deal with, um, and lack catalysts to deal with oxygen uh, free, free radicals. And then there's some evidence which is kind of intriguing to think about retinal metabolism in, in Jordi. So the idea has always been that Jordi is competing for your sterols, and maybe competing for other. Uh, of your products that then don't make it to your host cells or your host microbiome. And retinol is, a, is vitamin A, it's a fat soluble vitamin. It's actually, this is the pro form, it gets, it gets processed to vitamin A, that's more of a metabolizable form. And it's interesting uh, in the case that there's some clinical evidence that people that have geria or have had geria have kind of dysregulation of vitamin A. So there's some clinical presentations of this as well. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the microbiome side and the advertisement on my talk. So we've known for about 15 years that um, to use the animal or mouse model of Jordan, you have to pre-treat animals with antibiotics. Kind of just a generic last cocktail to get the, hu the human strains that are the most genetically practical to infect mice. So that's the common animal model. So they're already suggesting some protective effect of the microbial community on 
this kind of infection. There are Giardia strains that infect mice, but they're not culturable. Um, so we developed this time course where we uh, looked at amp cohorts of animals over time, with or without antibiotics, and then with or without Giardia. And then um, we did some really, and this is kind of a good course of infection I showed you, and then we did some uh, analysis of this. So essentially, this is the full Giardia increased, um, and in the darker gray is with antibiotics, day 3, 7, 14, compared to without. So you can see again, this is the case. What we noticed when we quantified the amount of bacteria was about a two-fold overgrowth in the Giardia infected antibiotic treated cells. There's a little bit of overgrowth otherwise. So very much stimulating. It's like overgrowth with the microbial community, just in general, it's the raw numbers. And then we did a very detailed anatomical sampling that showed you of the entire digestive tract, about 226 samples of 32 mice, a lot of reeds, and then called a lot of OTUs from all these regions, and we included both the luminal and the causal parts of the gut. And that's pretty much what we found, that geriasis does shift the gut microbial we're seeing this is looking at all the samples pulled together here uh, in uninfected versus infected and what's really uh, changing the most are proteobacteria particularly beta and gamma proteobacteria and vermicutes like clostridia change and the melanobacter which is the so in general we see overall increases in proteobacteria and decreases in certain kinds of vermicutes and melanobacteria then I mentioned we did this kind of spatially throughout, so now we can look at each region and ask what's up and down in each region of the gut. And just to summarize, the underlying, the underlying uh, ones are different uh, phylogenetic groups of alpha, or beta, and clostridia that are, and in this case, this side of the graph is the small intestine, so right would be the upper part, and there is the distal part. So there's a couple of cases where there's a big difference between the, the proximal and distal. Overall, there's a general trend of upper down. And then this would be on the other side, the hindgut of the mouse. So this would be the cecum and uh, feces. Feces would be orange and the cecum would be green. So again, same kinds of groups shifted. So Jordan not only shifts the microbial diversity where it's colonizing, but all the way downstream. And this is essentially at 14 days. So this is after that infection. The infection happens, Jordan colonizes, makes a nice home for itself, most likely interacting with the host, and then the Ship persists over time. You don't even know how it persists. Um, Mel Rosh in my lab, who worked on this, um, developed something which is, is an idea right now, but this, uh, this is something that we're applying the majority of microbial dysbiosis index, really taking key uh, groups of bacteria that are up and down and just kind of summarizing those. And it's, it's essentially a way of uh, thinking of it as a diagnostic. So if you just do QPCR of three different groups, you might be able to recapitulate these ships over time. You see the same things in just those groups, and summarizing, you would see the same kinds of effects <coughs> over time. So that was just kind of a way of summarizing the work. So I mentioned Giardia as an anaerobe. Um, it does mainly uh, amino acid and, and sugar uh, fermentation. Um, it does have this interesting affinity for oxygen, or oxygen is utilized kind of in slightly more. It, it, it's able to essentially get an extra ATP through this pathway using an enzyme that's called pyruvate for oxygen oxygen So essentially what you might think of is that oxygen is slightly lower than 250 nanomolar through this pathway, using alanine hydrogen with slightly more uh, oxygen concentration it can able to produce ethanol and acetate and extra ATP. So probably in the gut living on the spine line, depending on what the relax is, how it's going to shift. And you can imagine it might be beneficial to shift to get an extra ATP and if you overgrow, you're going to elicit a close response from like too much oxygen. And that seems to be kind of just the prediction that at some point you would have to detoxify it too much. So there's probably some sort of sweet spot where parasites are growing. They're not getting, they're kind of growing under the radar, right? Once they hit the radar, they're going to get the most oxygen neurotic response and then crash it. So they the evolved, I think, to live kind of in, in this threshold right at the edge of oxygen. And Probably as a consequence, the microbial community is changing. And it's possible that there's more direct interaction between Giardia and metabolism, competition, uh, other interactions between Giardia and microbes, which is not there yet. It's a good story. So, just to summarize a little bit, um, we noticed that the, the, the essential richness of the, the species of bacteria don't really change much over time, it's just really the relative. Uh, 
abundances of different groups. Um, we see this dysbiosis. We didn't throw out the whole gut within a couple weeks. We see these major shifts in certain groups of bacteria, and I can talk more about these to you guys. I'm just trying to summarize pretty quickly. Um, we think that the third infection is essentially altering the redox state, and we go directly and indirectly with those responses. And it's really affecting the overall carbon metabolism, probably modulating some sort of exotic lipid metabolism, and we see some bacteria that are involved in this. Essentially, this is a kind of a of bacteria is a kind that's upregulated in the small intestine, which is kind of bizarre, but it's um, and then dirty actually has in some interesting uh, compounds that it, it affects through its own metabolism, like the metabolism of the gut. So just the presence of one organism can really shift the whole microbial community. I'll say that uh, I was a, this is probably the first work on bacterial community dynamics I've ever done. <laughs> this by the uh, in the face lab. Um, and it, it was kind of something that I wanted to do for a long time. I think it's going to be uh, do it for a long time. So I guess I want to first thank Norm, of course. Um, as I've been a PI for a few years now, I hear myself saying things kind of like a parent, like, wow, that just came out of my mouth. <laughs> the introduction <laughs> age of the experiment. So it stuck. It's definitely stuck. Right? And I, and I realized as I talked to students in my lab, and I realized, too, that my mentoring style, I feel like, somehow reminds me a lot of Norm, and Norm in the lab a lot, the way Norm was interactive in the lab. Not a micromanager, the way some PIs can be, but interactive and in touch with what was going on. And that really stuck with me as a grad student, and I think I've really tried to make my lab that way based on that template. And every time I go away from, you know, for the way I come back, I realize how critical that is to kind of keeping things together. And I want to say the other kind of gift I got from being in Norm's lab was really you guys. I didn't realize I was marrying into a family, <laughs> but we all did, <laughs> right? And that those connections have lasted, and I've, now I've loved with Gary, I've loved with him, and i with Seven, and, and talked with a lot of you, and complimented and other people. I know it's Norm's lab over the year, and I had a lot of mentoring from other uh, people in the audience. So thanks to you, past and present case lab members as well. I just want to thank people in my lab who did a lot of the work. So Nav Rosh did all the microbiome stuff and the animal imaging. Um, she's a vet PhD student who just graduated. Plenty found did the host and then Jordia transcript don't work from the same samples. Um, Kate Herbert, who is a grad student with Jerry, now works with me. And we're cooking up cool ideas, something something to do with in vivo that is going on. Uh, and Jordia, and uh, I know there's some people from the Boulder lab hopefully here. You guys have helped me a lot too, and other people here on other parts of projects in the lab. Um, so I guess I'll just stop there and see if you guys have any questions. Sort of the obvious question if you take your antibiotic treated mice and then you infect Giardia, yeah. and then you take the feces from healthy mice, <laughs> do you mitigate the problem? We haven't done that. I can say I, we have data on the infected, and I have it. It's just it's the same story. It's just not as dramatic. So it's not. And what happens with the? It's not that dirty don't infect the non-antibiotic treated. It's just the infection is less consistent, meaning that we don't know the peaks as well. The feces part happens naturally with mice because they're coprophagic. So they so cage mates tend to have more similar microbiomes than not, and so we do. We have seen a couple of things that we thought might be cage effects of animals that one of them might have had a crazy infection and one of them ate feces of that animal and reinfected itself. And so we're, we're kind of, those are some interesting dynamics or behavioral dynamics of mice. So if you take a mouse with a lot of pathology, a lot of research signal, yeah. to a cage with like four healthy mice. We've not done that. That would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Species is fine, but that's what we did. We could not just select, we could just feed it if we wanted. Um, one, one artifact, it's not really, well, I guess it could be an artifact, but the natural course of infections you ingest cysts. And it's very difficult to produce infectious cysts in, in vitro. And so we have to infect with the trophozoic or swimming form. So we know there are dosage effects of how much dirty we can add over time. And so we're not we're kind of skipping the first part of the infection, um, and so we're trying both ways of producing these bioluminescent cysts enough that 
density that we can affect that. So, yeah. I'm curious, I'm trying to understand the dynamics between microbiome and me too. In, this, <laughs> in space, you know, in the lumen of the gut itself. Yeah. What's the relative size of Giardia? Yeah, I think that's that. Giardia is about 10 times the size of E. coli. It's about 10, 10 microns. So, it's, is there any predation going on? No, it doesn't, no. It doesn't have a mouth. It, it kind of has a bunch of vesicles on its surface, so it can do endocytosis and things like that, but it doesn't engulf bacteria. It kind of sits in the crypts of the villi. Um, so it's, you know, there would be mucus, there would be Billy cells, mucus, microbes stuck in that, and then Jardia extracellularly on top of that. So it could be directly interacting with them. There's some evidence that certain strains of mice, like the Jackson lab mice and the other, the other, the other mice, have yeah. And there are some bacterial differences in the microbiome. I think it's the signal. It's signal. It's nice. Yeah, there's some evidence that Jardia doesn't infect as well in, in those. So there might be some, I, I haven't rolled out direct, we just, this was kind of our first pass. And now I feel like we can get a little bit more finer detail on um, like gene expression and things like that. Yeah, what to look for. But I, I bet there's direct, direct effects. There's a lot of stuff in the literature about Giardia interacting with lactobacillin or using probiotics to treat Giardia or Orlid. Or, there's a lot of home remedies, home remedies for Giardia. Um, people, there's some good evidence, clinical evidence that people have had Giardia. Giardia are temporarily lactose intolerant. That comes back, so it's probably the microbial microbiome part of lactose tolerance, not the genetic part. Um, but there's a lot of, I think a lot of, there's a lot of in vitro stuff of Giardia plus a bacteria in a culture dish, and I think it's just not really contributing the in vivo situation. And that's really all we know about the in vivo cell damage is from culture, tissue culture cells with Giardia on top of it in semi aerobic media and a lot of data. <laughs> so I just, I don't really think about that as much. They always say, Jerry, you know somebody's got a pink you can smell it in the next county. Do you yeah. know from your metabolomics what the compound is that stinks to that chemical? It's supposed to some, sulf some sulfur derivative, I think is what it is. Um, we don't know from that yet. So we, we kind of have to, because of the sensitivity of, and the, the amount that we sample, I think we're going to have to go through several, this is our first round of it, we're going to have to go several rounds to get enough. Uh, it's just like some big data in the comparisons. But no, you know, I have, if, you, if you have an idea of what those are, I have the mass spec. <laughs> but all, a lot of it is un, unknown or unclassifiable stuff. Which, so, if anyone ever looked at the microbes that might be physically associated with the cells, in other words, is there, does Giardia have a microbiome? Um, there, it's funny, there are some, when you, when you cultivate cysts, um, in the early work that when people cultivated Giardia, they would isolate Giardia from a stool sample. You can plug it in sucrose gradient. <laughs> this is how it's actually diagnosed in, in your desk. Now, plugs to the top, take the cyst, you put it in uh, a medium, you add a lot of antibacterial antibiotics, and then you wait for Giardia to grow. The, a lot of those early papers talked about endosymbionts in Giardia that were then subsequently lost. So I don't know if they were, it has a microbiome, but they might have naturally associated bacteria uh, with them that we've cultivated out by uh, cultivating them in the lab. I'm a little bit wondering if they're sticking somebody with it. I wouldn't be surprised. Anaerobic eukaryotes always have buddies. <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with hydrogen metabolism. So termite, pranga, uh, eukaryotes, and cowrimin, and all that. Uh, and there's some bale and things like that. And even in the wild, and a lot of, a lot of evidence for Bacteria associated with anaerobic use. I mean, Giardia is just anaerobic use, it just happens to live in the gut. I wouldn't be surprised if we cultivated them out. And this always troubled me with some evidence around talking about bacterial genes that have been used as evidence that Giardia have mitochondria. Because we don't really know if they came from symbiological form of the ancestors. Well, this gets back to my yeah. question about the relative size, the physical size of Giardia versus bacteria. You say it has a microbiome and it's 10 times yeah. as big as its microbiome. That's like a person walking around with cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you an example of cats. Yeah. I can give you an example of something else in my lab we worked on in anaerobic ciliates in the cowrimin. And they have endosymbiotic antigens. And in one ciliate cell, they have about a thousand archaeal cells. So if you sequence, single cell sequence that, you sequence archaea. You do not get the nuclear genome at all because of the sheer density of archaea genome. <laughs> 
So, Michael, Michael, you care to do? I mean, do have associated with Michael? I probably would call it symbionts or endless amounts or endless amounts. Some of those might be obligate and might also be transients. You know, uh, I think this is a really understood, understudied part of, of biology. <laughs> so, you know, we kind of have our classic examples of associations of bacteria with curves, but not a lot of really good lab models. But, uh, what about viruses? I mean, obviously, there is a Giardia gir virus. virus that actually was developed um, as the first, essentially, way to genetically knock out and knock down genes in Giardia. Uh, CC Wang and used to uh, put a camera at Ribozyme and the Giardia virus <laughs> to knock out and knock down a gene. It, it kind that's of a synthetic group. There aren't any known. Yeah, well, that was the Giardia virus that they found okay. in the lab. It was a contaminant, or a contaminant, but it was with, in their culture, or stringing, and then they isolated it. They adapted it as a as a vector. Essentially, it's just it's it's not it's a hard model system. Just because of the so, I think that's that's the only one that I know about is the it's Georgia virus. You think IgA responds to your infection? Yeah, there it's so I didn't say this, but it looks like there's there's definitely some abnormalities in the human response. We do we do develop antibodies to Georgia, and that might be some reason for cyclicalness. Um, Parasites like, a lot of parasites like Giardia produce these variable surface proteins and antigens that they can switch or seem to switch up with any of the situations. So that's another way of the way they are made. Yeah, we did, we did notice some defects and defensins knocked down in the mouse tissue. So Giardia, I think, might be modulating the host immune system as well. And that might be why you don't see a lot of inflammation with Giardia, what you might expect to see. It's not like salmonella or another thing where it's just this wave of information. You don't really see that, and that's been troublesome, tricky to develop an animal model too because you just don't have the same signs. Mice don't also produce diarrhea, <laughs> and they don't grow up. So the reason I was told is that they, they're desert animals, and their job is to conserve water. So. So, thank you very much.